I'm just triple checking. Okay, we should be set. I'm not seeing the recording in the top of my, there we go, a little bit of delay. All right, we're recording. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon for the, the East Coast folks. Welcome to Maroon Bioinnovations webinar on fogging for indoor growing. We're focusing on biopesticides today and best practices for fogging indoors. Today we have continuing education credits. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the process, you can see the numbers below for the California DPR. Unfortunately, for the uh, certified crop uh, certified crop advisors, um, I'm, we're going to have to have you self-report this webinar. We did not secure the the credit in time. I apologize for that. We did secure Arizona Department. I'm just struggling to find the number at this moment, and I apologize. There's a there's always a paperwork trail. <laughs> uh, so we do have it. We're just trying to locate it. And then for Washington and Oregon, uh, if you're on, just remember that you need to engage in the online chat throughout the webinar and just put in parentheses as you engage. Like if you ask a question or we have some fun quiz questions throughout the webinar that anybody can participate in just make sure if you're in washington or oregon and you're and you're attending for credit that you um, put your state in parentheses when you're posting your question i know that's a little uh silly in my perspective but it's just one of the requirements that that those departments have for ensuring that you're on the webinar. Okay, if you have any questions or, or concerns or questions, or problems with that, just, just uh, message me in the chat and myself or my colleague Brenda will help you out. Okay, with that, I would just like to remind you that Marone Bio Innovations is a publicly traded company. And this presentation here is not to be used in any way, shape or form to help you decide if you want to invest in the company or purchase stock. You, we really encourage you to do your own due diligence and make your decisions based off of the information you gather, not this presentation. I would like to introduce our speakers. We have three amazing sp speakers today. They really are some of your, your best experts in the field when it comes to indoor fogging. The first is my colleague, Steve Bogash. He's the Territory Sales and Product Development Manager for the Northeast. He's based over in Pennsylvania and covers a wide uh, territory of a uh, fairly expansive territory throughout the Northeast. He'll explain in greater detail. However, I'd like to share that his career uh, started as owner and operator of Greener Horizons, a garden center, nursery and greenhouse and landscaping operation in Westminster, Maryland, before serving nearly 20 years as a horticulture edu educator and researcher for the Pennsylvania State University Cooperative Extension in State College, Pennsylvania. Since retiring from extension service, Steve joined Marone Bio Innovations as our Northeast Mid-Atlantic Product Development and Territory Business Manager. His territory runs from Southern, Cal Southern Virginia to Caribou, Maine, to the Western edge of Ohio. And he oversees several dozen university and private research company product trials, as well as many on-farm demonstration trials for Marone Bio Innovations. Steve says, one of the most exciting things about this stage of my life and career is helping to usher in the next wave of safe, effective biological pest management products. Steve and his wife, Roberta, live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where he is honing his carpentry skills, building wooden boats and renovating their home near the Sus Susquehanna River, built in 1933. I butcher it every time, Steve. <laughs> one of these days, I'll get it right. Well, anyway, Steve, thanks as always. Steve was the one who really brought this topic to our team and said, hey, we need to do more on fogging. Um, and as we can see, it's been very well received and there's a lot of people really craving the information. So thanks, Steve for your leadership and for always being a voice of education for our team. Um, now I'd like to introduce Rick Yates, who is the technical support manager for Griffin Greenhouse Supplies. Rick Yates uh, provides technical support for greenhouse growers excuse me, Griffin Growers Nationwide. He is best known for his thorough command of crop culture, particularly disease and insect control, plant growth regulation and crop nutrition. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture from the University of Maryland and operated corn, cornerstone greenhouses in Myersville, Maryland from 1986 to 1991. 
Rick writes regularly for the Griffin Gazette and has authored many articles in Greenhouse Trade magazines. He is a regular speaker on Griffin's educational programs and speaks at grower conferences across North America. His industry service includes collaboration with extension specialists across the country, a contribution for which he has he is highly respected. So Rick, thank you so much for being on today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your expertise. My pleasure. Thank you for that that uh, introduction. It's a little too much. <laughs> no. And then lastly, Jared, Jared Babick, Babick, excuse me, uh, Northeastern Sales uh, for Dram Corporation. Uh, Jared has worked with a, within the horticulture industry for over 20 years, joining the DRAM team in 2011. His goal is to assist growers in becoming more efficient with a focus on labor savings techniques, automation, and water management systems design. He is responsible for managing distributor and customer relationships throughout the Northeast. And outside of work, Jared competes in elite level, as an elite level cyclist, enjoys traveling with his wife, and all outdoor recreation, recreational activities. Activities. And Jared, you were just saying, I, I missed the beginning, but you said you were just, uh, I believe you're transitioning into a new role at DRAM. Could you share that really quickly? Yeah, I'm going to move uh, from day to day distributor support in the Northeast to more of a uh, more national key account role uh, for uh, uh, large growers, multi state operators, and also backing up our distributor reps when it comes to uh, large scale water integration projects and training for equipment. So, just a little wider area, a little more broad uh, brush, but still, uh, if you text or call for anything DRAM related, I'm still part of the team as a whole. Awesome. Awesome. And I'd love to hear more about your cycling. I love cycling. So uh, for another day. OK, we're going to go ahead and get started. Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you. I can advance the slides if you'd like. Are you comfortable with that or would you like to take it? I'm fine. You just go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Um, so um, so welcome, everybody. Glad, good to have everybody on this one today. I'm really excited that we're, we get to do a, a, a seminar just on fogging. Um, so Marone was founded in 2006. Um, the IPO um, taking us onto the NASDAQ was in 2013. Um, we have a manufacturing facility in Bangor, Michigan. The, com the company is based out of Davis, California. Quite a number of patents. And um, in the biological world, your inventory of microorganisms that you pull from has a lot to do with your success. We've got over 18,000 microorganisms in storage, and we constantly are resurveying them for various uses. Um, our CEO is Kevin Helash. Um, I think Kevin's been with us probably just since the very beginning of COVID, uh, but Kevin has taken the co company in some interesting growth directions. It's really good to be part of a company that's doing this kind of work. Next slide, please. Um, here's our portfolio. These are products that are out on the market at this point. Um, and so you'll see our um, PAA, our peroxide products, jet ag and jet oxide. Uh, we've got our fungicide and plant health products for Gallia and Stargus. We'll be discussing them more in my part at the end. Um, our insecticides and nematicides, Grandivo, Venerate, Magistine, and Zelto. Um, Haven, a really interesting um, uh, coconut oil based crop stress products for those that are growing tomatoes and peppers, especially in high stress conditions. Haven is something I'd love to talk to you about. Um, then for the row crop market, Pace Setter. And then um, recently uh, we bought a company in Finland and that's brought uh, Foramin and a number of other products and some seed treatment products as we expand. Next slide, please. Oh, and Rick, I guess we're handing this over to you now. So um, thank you. And Rick, take it from here on ultra low volume pesticide applications. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. It's a favorite topic of mine. And I have been uh, really since the late 1980s when I owned some DRAM equipment in my greenhouse operation. And I've been in distribution since 1991 and supporting uh, DRAM's fogging equipment out in the field for all those years. So I, I hope that I have a, a really wide range of experience to share from as we talk, uh, talk about the foggers. OK, so I think that it's really important when we start talking about why someone might consider investing in this technology. And the first thing I want to say is this is not inexpensive technology. And you'll understand why as as we get deeper into what's involved with it. But as you're thinking about the cost of it, the first thing I would do is say, 
can you prorate it? In other words, this is really durable equipment. And we talk to, fo- uh, to growers all the time that have foggers that are pressing on to 20 years in service, and maybe they needed some repairs, but they're still working. So as you think about the cost of the technology, think about it at, at least divide it by 10 for easily 10 years of faithful service. And then you start looking at per year. It really brings that, that number down. I think it makes it a lot easier to swallow the initial cost. The other thing I would say to you that um, nobody likes to spray and the people that we're hiring, um, maybe you're the primary spray person at your operation, but the people that we're hiring really would rather that we didn't even use pesticides, much less be out there spraying them themselves. So there's a big advantage in terms of reducing the amount of worker exposure when you go to fogging. Uh, a little bit later on, Jared will be talking about the DRAM autofog, which is totally automated. It's got timers, and you're not in the greenhouse when it turns on, and you're not in the greenhouse when it turns off. But even the other fogging technologies lead to a lot less worker exposure to pesticides. As a grower, and growing the poinsettias, of course, we're trying to make every square inch count. we got plants hanging out over the aisleways because space is heat and heat is money. And I can remember spraying down one side of the road with a hydraulic sprayer and then wiping my fanny and my Tyvek suit going down the other side on what I just sprayed. And there's none of that with fogging. So it's a really, really big advantage. The other thing is the fact that your best spray person, again, that maybe that's you, and the best hydraulic spray equipment cannot compete with the coverage that you're going to get from these ultra low volume applicators. And um, the smaller particle size is the key, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But there's also the concept that you're you're treating every square inch in the greenhouse. If there's a winged aphid hanging out on a pearl and overnight, it's going to get treated. If uh, in the unlikely event there's a couple of weeds tucked back in the corner behind that uh, at bench support, um, and you know they have aphids on them <laughs> there, you're treating them as well. And that's part of, of the advantage of this type of technology. In terms of decreased labor, I don't think I have to tell you that labor is really an issue. Um, It's difficult to get it, and certainly when we do get it, these folks aren't interested in spraying pesticides in most cases. So being able to decrease the amount of time that is necessary um, to apply the pesticides is a big advantage, and it goes really right to your bottom line. Uh, We mentioned briefly the autofog being totally automated. It takes a few minutes to set it up and put it in place and set the timers. And there's a brief cleanup procedure in the morning. Other than that, there's no labor involved in treating that, that greenhouse area. In terms of reducing pesticides, um, I would say in any individual application, are we using less of that pesticide than we would by hydraulic spraying? Maybe not. But where the savings come in is that we're making so much more effective application that over the course of a year, I'm making enough fewer pesticide applications. That's where I'm going to save on my pesticide money. And just bouncing back to the labor question for a second, um, even if you're using something like the DRAM cold fogger, which does have a high pressure hose and a nozzle, so you're starting in the greenhouse and backing your way out, DRAM's calculated it's about 10 times more time efficient than hydraulic spraying. And that's something I think as an owner operator, I can take that to the bank when I'm considering if I want to invest in, in some of this fogger technology. And I always like to say, you know, pesticides are expensive. Let's make the most of them. And using the ultra low volume equipment is the way to do that. And if you've purchased a half gallon of pylon recently, you know just what I'm talking about. We'd like to joke at the office, should they uh, finance at FHA or conventional? So if we're going to spend a lot on our pesticides, let's make sure that we're getting the very most out of them. And before we get off the cost quotient completely, I just wanted to add one thing. There are some things we run into, some less expensive foggers. And I put foggers in quotes because when we investigate this equipment, a lot of times they really would be better called uh, misters because the particle size is so much larger than ULV foggers that they're really misting and not fogging. And so if you run into this equipment, the first question I would ask is what the particle size is. Sometimes they're not able to tell us. That would be my first warning sign. And then make sure that they're able to tell you how to calculate the pesticide rates. I can't tell you how many times that my teammates and I get calls from somebody. Uh, Some guy um, in his shop (laughs) created a fogger. He has no idea what his particle size is and no idea how to calculate the pesticide rate. So ask the right questions. And if you need any help, we'll give you unbiased uh, opinions of what you're running into out there. 
slide's not advancing. Uh, there we go. Very good. Just a little bit of delay there. So Jared's got the high privilege of talking through this amazing technology. So I'm going to um, leave all that for, for Jared. But I want to say this, that no matter what size or configuration your operation is, there is a fogger that'll work in that configuration. I'd love to be able to sell auto fogs to everybody because of the small particle size and the automation of it. But let's be honest, if you have 20 Quonson huts um, and you're fogging a house at night, that's not going to work. So depending on that situation and how much, how much acreage, in some cases, you need to treat at night, there's different options out there, but there's something suited to all of that. I do want to point out, I mentioned it briefly before, that this is really well-designed and durable equipment. There's a reason that it costs what it does. And being on the end of having selling and supporting this equipment for decades, I can tell you that we have very few problems with DRAM equipment. And most of them, sorry to say, are, are user-initiated, just an initial not cleaning the equipment out properly after the application. So this is equipment you can count on. And when you go out there on Saturday night to fire up the fogger, it's going to work for you. One of the other advantages about this equipment is some of them only use water as the carrier. It's not only a cost advantage, but carriers sometimes can bring their own challenges. But even the DRAM equipment that requires a fogger, the, the, the fogging solution is much improved. It's now actually a foliar, fun, a foliar, um, a foliar fertilizer and that does some good things like st uh, slowing down evaporation of the particles, things like that. So it's very safe to use. It fogs just fine and it's not very expensive. So a lot of, a lot of advances in terms of that. And not, another advantage I really like to talk to growers about is the, the fact that we're using so little water in these applications that we keep the foliage dry. And all of us, for good reason, understand that, you know, we know that botrytis, the plant pathologist tells us, will make penetration into healthy tissue with just two to four hours of free moisture on the leaf surfaces. Well, um, if it's the last week of, of April and I've got a greenhouse full of geraniums in full bloom and there's a forecast of three or four days of rain and mist coming up, I want to put a fungicide down. And the last thing I want to do is go in there with a hydraulic sprayer and wet everything down. It might take a day and a half to dry. You can make that application with your fogger. Um, you Maybe you're spraying for uh, fogging for thrips and you can add a botrytocide in there. In most cases, there's a lot of compatibility that we can do there. I can do that without ever making the foliage wet. And that's, uh, in some cases, that's worth the price of admission. Seems to be a little bit of lag time here when I try to advance the slide. Thank you. So and, and what I'm trying to do in this slide and, and start off at the upper left hand corner with a conventional hydraulic sprayer. Now, if you've got a, a backpack a pump up sprayer on your back, you're probably close to the 400 micron size. Some of the better hydraulic sprayers are 100 microns, maybe a, a tad smaller. But when you start looking at the fogging equipment below, and I'll start with the cold fogger type technology at 30 to 60 microns per square foot, I'm putting a thousand times more particles in that same square foot uh, for the same amount of water. And then as you can see with your pulse fog, as the particle size gets even smaller, we're talking about 10,000 ti 10, times more particles. And then my favorite, you know, the autofogger down to almost 19,000 uh, times more particles in there. So particle size really matters. And we're going to try to to make a little bit of a visual um, explanation of that going forward here. So as I said, particle size really matters. And when you're talking about a 400 micron particle or even a 200 micron particle and a hydraulic sprayer, a lot of that spray material is deflecting off of the leaf surfaces and even getting to the target. And the last thing we wanna do is take those expensive pesticides and let them bounce off the leaves. It's compared to a fogger, it's almost like trying to spray your plants with a fire hose. So even the, the best hydraulic sprayers, which do get a, a better particle size, can't compete with that. That and uh, the fact that there's virtually no runoff from fogging. And you know, again, we're all concerned about the environment and pesticides hitting the floor is not only expensive, there's potential risks there as it gets into the groundwater and so forth. So these are all things to be considered. So as we're talking about reducing the particle size, um, what we're doing is um, with the particle size is so small in the foggers that we have the ability to have those particles swirl up underneath the foliage and get deep down into growing tips. And when you start thinking thinking about um, broad mites that are very small, very reclusive. I've even seen them tucked between the petals in a Gerber daisy bloom. Then you can start to see why the size of the particle could be really important.
So I'm, since I'm not controlling this slide, we'll see what happens. But um, the first particle size is your, your 100 micron size. So again, that would be a, a good hydraulic sprayer. It would give you a particle that size. The fogger with the largest particle size, even at, let's say, 50 microns, with the same amount of water and putting eight times as many particles down, uh, for the same volume of water. Now, when we get into the auto fog range, or the pulse fog range, we're talking about a thousand times more particles from that same water droplet uh, because of the very small micron size. So I hope that's a really good visual illustration, but I got one more for you. And these are DRAM slides, and I appreciate them. I've used them over the years, and growers have found them very helpful. So in this case, the first uh, thing we'll show you is, is the equivalent of 100 micron size. So that there's your coverage from a given amount of water. Now, when we get, break it down to 50 microns, those orange dots will eventually, there they go, you can see that you've, you've already done a lot to improve your coverage. Now, when we get into the 10 micron size, you can see there's no place to hide. So I hope that's a really good visual demonstration of it. And it's not just for insect control. The same thing, if I'm trying to put a thorough coverage out on a leaf to stop botrytis or powdery mildew, that coverage is extremely important. And with particle size so small, there's no runoff. Where it hits is where it's going to stay. So what type of pesticides can be fogged? The, the really good news is the fact that the majority of greenhouse labeled pesticides can be applied by fog. We'll talk about the exceptions, um, but there's a, an awful lot that can be and, and a little bit more in a minute. We'll, we'll get a little bit more detail on that. Some of the exceptions would be things that are physically incompatible with fogging. And the best example, I think, are the oils. And oils have a unique mode of action. They work by coating the insect or the mite, filling up all the air openings in it and causing it to suffocate. So that extremely small particle size that is to our advantage in virtually every other pesticide is a disadvantage in the case of oils. So we don't use oils through there. There's only one microencapsulated product I'm aware is still in the market for greenhouses, which is Duragard, a microencapsulated chlorpyrifos. And the problem there is that going through these nozzles, it would likely rupture, rupture those capsules. And the last thing we want to do is put um, pure technical grade chlorpyrifos out on a crop. That's not likely to end well. So microcaps, we don't fog as well. Now, the pulse fogs are thermal foggers, and there are a handful of products that are damaged by the high heat that it produces to create a, a well-known fungicide, and several of your fun, fungus-based um, pesticides have the same issue. The good news is that DRAM's already gone out ahead of us with the technology, and there's what's called a biopulse fog, which quickly cools the, the, the fog stream down and allows us to use those heat-sensitive products there, and Jared will give you the lowdown on that in a couple of minutes. Some other exceptions, there are some times where the EPA label, label uh, restricts the use. Um, in the case of chlorothalonil, which is the active ingredient in your daconil products, there's said to be an eye hazard with that active ingredient. So the EPA on their label um, restricts the application, uh, the PSI and whatever applicator you're using to 300 PSI, which rules out your foggers. That's pretty rare. In a couple of cases, um, there are manufacturers that tell us that because they haven't trialed their products through foggers, they don't want us to recommend it. Fortunately, that list is getting smaller all the time. And one of our functions at GGS Pro is we work closely with the chemical manufacturers and several of the major manufacturers are doing a great job. And you'll hear from Marone and what they're doing here in a minute. Um, they're doing a great job of making their labels fogger friendly and giving us the support we need that we can recommend those products with confidence. Now, when we talk about oxidizers and we mentioned the, um, the Jet Ag product a little while ago, but also products such as Xerotol and Sanidate. If they're oxidizers, we need to make sure that we're using a fogger with stainless steel nozzles. In some cases, they're standard on the foggers, they're optional in others, but if you use those products, make, make very sure that your equipment's been modified in order to handle that without any problems. This is a bulletin that's available to anyone on the asking. What we do is we update it every year or two. Um, this is a list of products based on the type of cold fogger that you shouldn't fog and for the various reasons that we just um, mentioned, but some growers liked having that list in one place in front of them and we're perfectly happy to provide that. So let's talk about rate calculations. We'll try to take the mystery out of it for you. There are a very few, and I mean a very few, pesticides that actually include um, ultra low volume application information on their labels. And NSTAR AQ is one that uh, I thought would be good to look at. And you can see there, uh, based on the square footage, they'll give you the amount of, of their insecticide that they want applied either preventatively or curatively. And when that information exists, that's what we recommend to the grower. 
in most cases, um, that's not the case. So we're going to use the, uh, the the guidelines that are provided by DRAM in order to do that. So for products that the label doesn't forbid fogging applications, we always go with the DRAM recommendations. And we'll do a, an example here on the next slide. So I just want to talk you through this, and then we'll actually take a real real life example and hope that'll make it uh, really easy to understand. So we start off with the per 100 gallon rate, and when we say that, that is the hydraulic spray rate. And we'll talk about in a minute, Avid at eight ounces per 100 gallons to give you an example how that might work. Now there's a multiplier that's applied that DRAM supplies to us, and it varies a little bit by the equipment on the autofog multiplier is 0.35. That's the high end, and that's the end that we recommend. And then the cold fog and the pulse fog, we use a multiplier of 0.4. And now we'll take a look at how that, that plays out in real life. Okay, so here we're going to take autofog as the example, and we're going to apply Avid in a 3,000 square foot greenhouse, so a typical Quonset house, and the label rate is 8 ounces per 100 gallons, so I'm going to apply the multiplier provided by DRAM, which is 0.35. So what that tells me is that I need 2.8 ounces of Avid to fog 10,000 square feet. I do want to point out this isn't cubic feet. You don't need to know your cubic feet. It really doesn't matter. It's the square feet because what we're concerned about is the deposition of those pesticide particles over a given area. So we don't care if your greenhouse roof is eight feet or 16 feet, we're going to use the same rates and that's really handy. But I only need to treat 3,000 square feet and that number is for 10,000 square feet. So I just multiply it by 0.3 uh, to get the 0.84 ounces. So think about that for a second. I can thoroughly treat every square centimeter of a 30 by 96 or 30 by 100 greenhouse with 0.84 ounces of avid so this is a very efficient procedure we do need to talk about the water and the recommendations we get for dram and these are i'm going to say minimum recommendations we'll talk about why we might use more water than that in some cases so the minimum recommend recommendation is two to four liters for an autofog per 10,000 square feet so think about that four liters from roughly a gallon if you're fogging a, a gallon of water into 10,000 square feet, you're not getting anything wet. You're not causing any puddles on the leaves that might encourage disease. Really a great benefit. So this is a chart, and I will say that um, we provide this fogger chart that anyone that purchases their fogging equipment through Griffin will provide this. And all we ask of the growers, the square footage of all the various houses, however many that is, and we provide this fogger chart for them. We've developed this because it's a lot of work to do it longhand and growers are busy people. And so it's been a really big benefit uh, in order to provide this. And, and I will say also that about every 18 months, uh, we go through and we will um, update it. We'll take old chemicals off, add new ones on and send them out to the growers without them even asking. If they purchase equipment from us, we're gonna stick with them. I do wanna point something out. If you look down at the second line there and where it says affirm, and you look at the water across the bottom, you'll see that all the smaller houses have the same amount of water and it's two liters. And the reason is that two liters is the minimum amount of water that we're gonna use to fog with in order to properly prime the equipment, just in case that caused any confusion. And then obviously the, the water rates go up with the square footage. Okay, so there are occasions where you know we can um, use more water than that two to four liters, and typically two liters is for EC materials, liquid materials, and four liters would be for uh, WDGs and wettable powders. However, there's there's cases where we might want to use more water, and that's perfectly fine because we're using so little water. Again, all we care about is do we get the pesticide evenly distributed on the foliage, and whether I do that in two liters or four liters or eight liters, not a problem. It's it's going to work. Work, uh, the same way no matter how much water we apply we just simply need to adjust the fogging time the smaller auto fogs use um, two liters per hour the bigger ones go at three liters per hour and all that information is readily available in the owner's manual so why might you use more water in a particular application well there's some of the products especially some of the really good um, biofungicides that are microbial based stargus which is bacillus based is one an example of that and you can see that the foliar spray rates through hydraulic sprayer are two to four quarts per 100 gallons we don't usually use that high rate fine we don't need it but if we did if we take that four quart per 100 gallon rate i would need to apply 44.8 ounces of stargus into that 10,000 square foot greenhouse when you start thinking about just uh, applying it in four liters of water let's say that could be a, a pretty concentrated solution so we might decide for that reason to go ahead and put more water in adjust the fog time up
there are certain products and regalia is one of them that are more viscous and the the uh, the spray solution one it's high volume two is it's kind of thick so by increasing the water we make sure it flows through the fog without any problems there's a little bit of trial and error but if in doubt add more water you just need to watch out for the capacity of your fogger the smaller foggers hold seven liters the bigger ones hold 14 liters and the other time we might add more water if we're doing a tank mix and we're going to talk about tank mixing here in just a second i'm sure there's some questions related to that but since we're we're using so little water when we put materials in as a tank mix we're concentrating them quite a bit more so than they would be in a hydraulic spray tank so we may add more water just to give them a little more breathing room when we're combining more than one active ingredient at a time So can you tank mix? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, we do it uh, fairly frequently. Um, there are a, a few considerations that are a little different from hydraulic spray, and I want to make sure that you know we talk about that. And I just mentioned the fact that since we're using so much less water, it's really a benefit. Um, it does mean that these two uh, two or more active ingredients are meeting in a more concentrated state than they normally would. So when you do your jar test for unfamiliar tank mixes, you want to make sure that you're replicating the higher concentration that will be required for fogging. If you need help with that, we are more than happy to help you do those calculations. Um, also, you know, so we will increase the fogger capacity, the, the amount of water if our, if our fogger capacity allows for. That's all the size of that chemical tank. And there's another thing that's a really nice feature, the auto, autofog, for example, and I'm talking about autofogs a lot, um, but there's, you know, this is just one piece of the, the DRAM stable of equipment, but it's one that our, our, we sell more of than any other pieces of equipment. Um, with an autofog, it's so easy to use it. If you find that there is a tank mix that's not compatible, either it's just too thick or the, the chemicals aren't compatible together at a high density, it's so easy just to fog it a second time. I used to live on location with my greenhouses, and I would come down after supper and put the second chemical out because it's not that the chemicals are incompatible in the leaf surface. It's that at the high concentration in the chemical tank, they might not be. And so that's a, a really easy workaround in that case. That actually was my last slide. I'm getting into Jared's stuff, so I want to uh, <laughs> want to uh, cede the floor to Jared. And I think later on we'll have a chance to ask some questions, answer some questions. Okay, sorry about that. It takes me a while to get to the right features. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, Rick. We have some questions. Go right ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to go here. So um, let me pull it up. I have my colleague texted texting them to me. Okay, so the first question is from Christian. Can you use cold foggers to apply calcium chloride for poinsettias? This is Christian Collins from Oregon. Yes, um, we've done a, a fair amount of work using autofoggers and cold foggers to apply calcium chloride to poinsettia bracts. We use 0.55 ounces per thousand square feet for that. Great question. Okay, awesome. And if you see, I'm just um, trying to keep the presentation up, so it's hard for me to also see chat at the same time. But if others see questions in the chat, other speakers, don't be afraid to bring them up. Um, or Brenda, if you can unmute yourself, you can certainly, okay, I've got a couple more coming in. All right, so the next question is from Saul Alba. Alba. Uh, my understanding is that ULV is less than 25 micron diameter, uh, diameter droplets. Anything larger is, anything larger is not ULV. What is your opinion? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's easy for us to kind of lump things together from a technology standpoint. So if that's the accepted uh, I, micron size, I wouldn't wouldn't argue with it. Um, wouldn't argue with that. That's perfectly fine. They're all low volume applicators. Some of them would qualify as ultra low volume applicators. All right. Uh, another one from Saul as well. How can you confirm that droplets are reaching the side of the greenhouse that is furthest from the fogger? Is there an indicator paper or fluorescent dye that you can add to the mix? Yeah, there, there's um, there's water sensitive um, fogging 
uh, material that Dre might even be able to provide to you on a on a trial basis there to try it out. So yeah, and and we'll say this: the best thing to do if you, when you get your fog is just put water in it the first night and go in and run it for the normal cycle and then turn the lights on and you'll see that it's like a London fog. If you do it during the daytime, you don't see it. The particles evaporate pretty quickly, but when apply it at night, uh, you're getting thorough coverage and the <laughs> the coverage ranges that Jared will probably mention when he talks about the individual equipment. They come out of a lot of research by DRAM and just how far the particular foggers can can effectively cover. So I think you feel more confident about that. Anecdotally, yeah. it works great for the growers. We're gonna, and we're going to cover that. And just a Good. comment about the hydrosensitive paper. When you get above 25 microns, and yeah, I, that's kind of the cutoff that we would generally use for ULV versus LV or low volume, which is a cold fog or electrostatic sprayer. Typically, once you get below 25 microns and you're you're adding essentially humidity to the greenhouse or the space, uh, you might actually just get a change or coloration in general of the paper just because the humidity increase. So it, it's not the best form versus what uh, uh, Rick had said about visually seeing it with a flashlight in the dark. However, above 25 micron with those low volume applicators and hydraulic, uh, well, I'll group that all together where you, you're hiding those pieces of hydrosensitive paper not only to see coverage, but also as a good test for applicators to do training. Um, that hydrosensitive paper is, is a great way to not only detect if you're getting the coverage, but make sure you're getting the coverage adequately based on whoever's making the application. Thanks, Jared. Awesome. Are there any other questions in the chat? Speakers, can you see? Or I'm not getting any more from my colleagues. So I just want to make sure before we transition. I'm going to I'm going to throw one out real quick for Rick. Um, so, Rick, you didn't touch on adjuvants at all. Um, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm a hydraulic guy. I'm, I'm yeah. committed to using the right spreaders and spreader stickers. Is there any role for adjuvants here? OK, great question. The reason I didn't mention it is that we seldom, if ever, use them. Now, hydraulic spraying, totally different story. I'm in the same camp and we are, are, are big fans of, of organosilicons and similar products. In fogging, we really don't need it, don't want it. The only time that we ever recommend it, if we have a grower that has a cranky wettable powder that wants to settle out in the tank faster than we can get it put out, um, we will use like in an auto fog, use a very low rate. We use a half a teaspoon of capsule, which is an organosilicon blend per four liters of water and it seems to help the particles re repel themselves I, each other i'm not sure what the the mode of action is but growers have found that to be helpful so it's a very low rate uh, but in terms of the application on leaf service you won't need it with this very small particle size we'll and, and, I, 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 and i thank you rick and i saw another one come through i'm assuming it's from the cannabis industry somebody was asking about fogging with silica definitely outside of my experience so any experience with fogging with silicon materials no, but we'd love to try it. If they want to work with us, give us a call at the office and our CEA team works with hemp and cannabis and we'd love to set up a trial and see see if we can make that work. I suspect it, yeah, I suspect it would be a little concerned about abrasiveness of the silicon particles, but maybe not. I'd like to try it. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and transition. But before we do, um, I we just want to, you know, give a little love out to those that are attending the webinar live. And so we have two uh, different times throughout the webinar where we'll have a little giveaway. So you can see here it's a Leatherman uh, multi-use device or a gallon jug canteen. And I'll need you to use your chat function. So if you're multitasking right now and you want a chance to win one of these prizes, uh, get focused on you know looking at your screen and getting the chat open. Please make sure if you are signed in anonymously that you write your name when you answer. And then too, if you're from Washington or Oregon, please participate in answering this question, even if you don't get it right, and put your state in parentheses and this is just if you're with washington and oregon and wanting credit okay so here's the question and you need to answer it correctly obviously and you need to spell it correctly okay so there are three companies that have are lending their expertise on the webinar today three different companies list the names of those companies full names please and correctly spelled and I have a terrible frog in my throat, so excuse me while I cough. All right, and I will have my um, my colleague Brenda. She's going to watch and see who answers the question 
correctly, the first person to answer the question correctly. And then she is going to correspond with you directly to get your email and find out which prize you'd want. Just give us a couple of weeks to get prizes out, you guys. I don't know if any of you are experiencing it, but supply chains are backed up all over the country, world, in all different areas. Uh, so just be patient with us, but I promise you, you'll be getting your gift um, will come through for you, okay? I have another quick question before we transition. So... Um, I just want to make sure, I mean, you said uh, adjuvant, Steve, is this, are you answering the question about oils or is this a separate question? It says, how about um, oils? Yeah. So Rick had answered that earlier. Okay. We don't, yep. we don't adjuvant. fog with oils. Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Just double checking guys. All right. And with that, are we going to have Jared take over now? Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to stop my screen, Jared, so you can share yours. Sure, and super excited. There's just a ton of, everyone's getting the answer right. So it's a race to who gets the, the swag. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen uh, right now. And thank you for that introduction. I think I'm gonna uh, uh, change my uh, 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 kind of identification of who I am from kind of elite cyclist back to just pedaling slow in new places. So if you have great places where you've got trails and you know, you want to talk about DRAM and fogging, email me and I'll come visit you with my my gear. So um, uh, let's let's move on uh, again. Jared from DRAM, thanks for having us. Um, we're going to be talking uh, about ultra low volume equipment selection. Thanks to Rick uh, and GGS Pro. They are awesome. I love working with them every day on talking with uh, growers from every sector on, you know, every kind of piece of equipment because we could talk about every different kind of particle size out there. But, uh, you know, just a little bit about DRAM. If you don't know who we are and where we come from, we've been around for 80 years. Uh, if you've got watering tools, they're probably DRAM watering tools from your water breaker to your wand and uh, irrigation systems and environmental control and chemical application like we're talking about and even full water integration. So this is my shameless plug for the day. But just so you know, I mean, there's efficiencies everywhere in every type of uh, greenhouse or growing structure. So it doesn't have to be just one. There's rooms. There's room to improve everywhere. And if, if it involves water, we're probably uh, out there helping you out every day. So um, with that, uh, we're going to kind of jump into chemical application equipment, right? It's a, it's a great discussion. We could be here for hours and, and I'm happy to talk more. I'm sure Rick and uh, Steve are as well, but there are various types out there from what you see in those jugs and little sprayers that I grabbed many, many years ago under a grower's counter uh, and they're tools in a toolbox. You know, you need to have wrenches and hammers and screwdrivers. Um, you know, you can't do you can't have one piece of equipment uh, that does everything uh, as good as specialized equipment does. And there are a variety of particle sizes from, you know, 100 to 300 microns down to five. So. Uh, there's a range of equipment out there depending on what you're trying to treat, what your pest or disease is or sanitation issue is. Uh, so, you know, learning more as I have down here, education is the best tool in your toolbox because the more you know about tool selection, the more efficient you're going to be and uh, more labor saving you're going to have. And if everybody in, in every kind of greenhouse we grow plants knows that labor is an issue and time is an issue. And so, the more you know about this type of equipment, uh, the more you can streamline uh, your IPM program and maybe have a little time to just relax for just a little bit each day. So, um, you know, uh, just a little bit about the different types of application methods that are out there. You know, in general, there's high volume hydraulic. Everybody needs a big wet sprayer. Uh, that that kind of tool right in the middle is that low volume, you know, 30 to 60 microns, which has some drift, but not enough to float around everywhere. And of course, at the other end of the spectrum is your ultra low volume category, which is these are particles that float like your auto fog, like your pulse fog, your air assisted um, um, uh, uh, foggers that are out there. So uh, lots of different tools out there and, and knowing how they work and where to use them and where to pick them is the best. And you've heard us talk about this. And this is kind of the only couple of slides where uh, Rick and I overlap and for good reason, because it's really important to understand that we're working in terms of uh, particle size and we utilize micron as a unit of measure and we've got this you know uh, 100 micron droplet and just to give you an idea of what that is uh, 100 micron droplet is equal to about the width of one of your hairs so if you want to know what that is um, yeah pull one of your hairs out look at it that's 100 microns 
and then you move down to low volume, which you know, you're getting about eight droplets per every 100 micron droplet and ultra low volume, you're getting about a thousand droplets. And so, you know, that's kind of what this looks like. And you can see, wow, one droplet is equating to all these droplets, which equates the surface area and coverage and, you know, being able to get a hold of those pests and diseases where they're hiding or where they're, you know, floating around above the crop. That's what's great about a uh, whole house application is you're not just treating on a leaf tissue surface or in a dense canopy, but you're also treating all of the areas around the uh, the greenhouse or indoor space where they might fly off to when you're down there with your wet sprayer or your pump up sprayer. So, um, you know, that's what it kind of looks like. And so, yeah, big wet sprayers, we've got large particles, as Rick said, you know, 100 to 300, 100 to 400 microns. It's a wet spray. You see it. It's wet. You know, you got it. You don't have a lot of drift, so you can stay within a contained space. And we'll speak a little bit about that later. But, you know, we have very little drift and sometimes that's a very good thing. So don't discount any of this other equipment as we talk about uh, whole house applications, because there's a reason we have it. But you're in there for longer. You've got someone dedicated to doing it. You know, that wet spray might not be getting as efficient a coverage as some of the smaller particles that are out there through some of the other equipment. And of course, you're using more water, as Rick alluded to. It takes more time. You're adding humidity, uh, you know, so you do have more water usage and maybe more chemical usage based on how efficient your applicators are. Some some applicators use, you know, half as much. Some use twice as much and even within the same greenhouse. So that's where training really comes in and education on understanding the volume of active ingredient that should be applied um, in a space is, is and being consistent with that is really important. You can have the best piece of equipment in the world. And if, if you don't have an understanding or you're not using it properly, uh, you're not getting the best benefit out of it. So, you know, in, in on average, it can be 10 to 50 gallons per 10,000 square feet. And you're going to you're going to see how much we use with whole whole house application for uh, for fogging. And you're going to go, wow, that's that's a that's a big difference. So, uh, and again, variable coverage. You might you might get under that leaf, you might not, and you're certainly not getting the airspace above it. So that's kind of where. And just so you can kind of see it, this is what we mean by. that's a wet spray, right? It drifts five, 10, maybe 20 feet, but it doesn't go any further. So you're out there doing all the work, trying to get as good a coverage as you can. So that just on that one end of the spectrum, and we are gonna to go to the far end of the spectrum and talk about ultra low volume. And, and I apologize, I have my whole screen covered. If I see questions, please, if uh, someone could write them down because I'm not seeing them since I'm sharing my screen, but we're talking about much, uh, much smaller particles, anywhere from five to 20 microns, the autofog being, you know, five to 10 microns, the pulse fog being a little larger just because of the method we use to create those particles, but very small and floating. And as Rick alluded to, you're not using a lot of water. So this is essentially a dry application. You're not having wet spots form on leaf tissue surfaces. Uh, so, and you're not using a lot of water. And we've got, a, we've got extreme drift and we want that. We want this material to drift around the house uh, to get that uh, equalized coverage in one 30 by 96 or six acres, you know, of peppers. Uh, we want that to drift around and we'll talk a little bit about how to get that uh, homogenized within that space. Again, zero or very low labor, as we alluded to, the auto fog is kind of set it and forget it. The pulse fog is very quick, so you're not in there for very long. So we'll get into a little bit about how you choose towards the end of the presentation. Um, but again, very low water usage. You saw 10 to 50 gallons per 10,000 square feet. How about 34 to 128 ounces in 10,000 square feet? So you can see, because we have much smaller particles, we do not need the volume of water necessary to dilute it down. And that's really where it counts. And lastly, what you're paying for is even coverage. We're homogenizing the space, we're getting it everywhere within the canopy, above the canopy. So if you've got you know, bedding plants on your bench and you've got baskets up above, you know, instead of spraying on the bottom and spraying on the top and getting yourself all wet, like Rick alluded to, you're basically getting these things in there, creating cloud, and it, it's doing all the work for you. So uh, that's what ULV fogging is all about. Now, Jared, <laughs> I'm yes. Jared. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm capturing all the questions for you. There's a slew of them. We'll do the, we'll we'll do the Q and A after your presentation. Okay. 
Yep, and a lot of these might actually get answered. I saw some, and they're, you know, some are going to get answered actually right now. But I might actually get some of those answered as we're as we're talking about this equipment and how it works. So, um, uh, but yes, happy to take them directly afterwards. So, a lot of people ask or want to understand more about how this fog moves around. As I said, it 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 drifts. It wants to drift. Uh, but you do have a concentrated active ingredient. We're, like Rick said, we're putting the same amount in there just with a lot less water. And it can be slow to homogenize within the space. And, uh, you know, air movement can be a great accelerator of this homogenization. And I love to use this picture and this description of a glass of water and some concentrated dye. When you squirt that out there, it, it's a little slow to create that nice pink space. Uh, and if you took a spoon of that glass, and in my world or your world, it would be fans. You're helping to homogenate that and even it out throughout the space, and you're getting something like this. So that's where air movement can be a great accelerator of homogenation. And in some sp in, in some spaces, like my last comment here, for very large spaces, you do need air movement. Or if you have a very dense canopies, you want air movement. It is the highway system of your greenhouse, your indoor space, whatever it might be, that's really what these tiny particles, they only drift so far. And if they have stuff in the way, whether it be racks or uh, trusses or whatever, uh, having air movement to help push that fog around the open space or help it push into a very dense canopy, uh, that's where air movement can be a great accelerator and, and help us out. Now, a lot of people ask, do I leave my fans on? Yeah, for, for large spaces and, and, and very dense canopies, I want that fan to be running during the fog cycle. Once that uh, homogenization has occurred, maybe plus 30 minutes after the fog cycle has, has happened, and you have the ability to manually or automatically shut down your fans or really slow them down a lot, uh, we recommend that so the fog can kind of set up, do its thing. It's gonna hang for two or three hours if you give it the chance. And that's with the auto fog or the pulse fog and the more contact time you have, the more efficacy you're going to get out of the active. So, you know, that question of when do I, when do I, you know, pull all that out? I wait as long as possible, depending on your REI, when you got to get back in there or turn your lights back on. And just remember that when you do do that, you do need to get a couple of turns of air, uh, however you can to get into the space based on some of those uh, worker protection standards. So understand that, but fans always help. If you have fans, use them. If you want to turn them off after, sure, go ahead just after it's homogenized. So I know I saw that question about dead spots. That's a big discussion that leans a little bit more towards proper air movement. And, and we could talk about that. In fact, we've got a white paper on proper air movement on the DRAM site. But if you've got dead spots, if you have fans, maybe it's something to consider in terms of looking at where those spots are occurring and, and looking at your setup of your fans and the type of fan that you have. Um, so. Uh, now you hear all this, what Rick and Steve and I have been talking about, and you're going, man, why do I need anything else? Like it's the magic bullet. It literally does everything. I'll never have to work a day in my life ever again. And if you got the first part of my conversation, we need other tools for, for reasons. As, as Rick alluded to, mode of action, you know, soaps, oils, you know, they could probably go through. They just don't work as well based on the mode of action of that chemistry, you know, the type of chemistry. Uh, you know, as uh, again, Rick alluded to uh, um, uh, micro encapsulated products, oils, soaps, uh, you know, those things are kind of goopy or the MOA is a problem or they don't they're not compatible when you mix them up. You know, you want to do that test. But there are some products that you need that big wet sprayer for for everything that I just kind of talked about. Timing is a great conversation. I could spend probably an hour just on this slide. Timing of year, you know, let's say you've got five acres or I'll short, shorten it, one acre of greenhouse space, you don't open up that whole acre at a time based on it's winter time and you're getting things started. And when you fog, you have to remember this is key. If you've got an acre of open space, you've got to treat that entire space with enough active ingredient because remember, you can't control where it's going to go. I've heard comments from growers that said, oh, I only fog this one half of my space and then, then I went back the next day because of the size of my machine. I couldn't fit it all in there. Like Rick talked about, dilution is key. You know, you can't do that. You're throwing a 50% punch at the bug and it's just laughing at you. Uh, and that's how, you know, that's how we get resistance. So, you know, if it's the time of the year and you only got one or two bays open, I don't want to fog a whole acre. And again, that's why I want to pull up my backpack sprayer or my hydraulic 
because I just don't need to put all that active out just to treat those, you know, a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand square feet at the beginning of the year. Your greenhouse type, you know, if you've got an old greenhouse that got holes in it, the fog is really good at drifting and it'll drift right outside. I had a, a great grower uh, down in Virginia, you know, and he told me this story about they called the fire department because he fogged his house. It was an old house. And at the end of the day, someone saw smoke, which was the fog coming out. And so he, they thought the greenhouse was on fire. So you got to have a tight house. If you've got a hoop house that has roll up sides, it's got to be closed down. Uh, you know, you got to create a bubble. So you got to take in the greenhouse type uh, when you're making a, a, a decision on these machines. And then pests and disease, as Rick alluded to again on choosing your chemical, some pests, mealybugs, scale, that you're not going to touch them with a with a with a, a speckling of particle. You got to get that wet sprayer out. If you've got webbing, that's too late for a fog with spider mite. You got to get the big wet sprayer out. So you got to have options. And again, mixed crop. Like I said, if you've got vegetables that are organic next to your you know geranium crop in the same acre, and they have different requirements for what chemicals, you can't you can't keep fog in one space. So you need to take that into consideration when it comes to choosing which equipment and where you place your plants uh, and then number spaces, which kind of boils down to choosing between which type of fogging uh, applicator. Uh, you know, great auto fogs, great, but you can only do one a night uh, versus, uh, you know, if you've got 10 spaces, it doesn't work that well. So lots to consider with just this one slide here. I could go on and on. Uh, but as I said, when you're using this equipment, you got to have a bubble. You can't have any openings. You can't have doors open, vents, anything. That fog is really good at drifting and it'll, it'll hang on to any air movement that's going in and out of that space. The chemical conversion rate that Rick went over, there are experts. Please rely on Rick and his team. Uh, there's a lot of new products that are out there that we're learning about in certain you know, newer industries. And, and we, we're still figuring out those conversion rates with uh, uh, GGS Pro. Uh, and and uh, companies like Steve and uh, Marone. So, you know, we're working on some of this new stuff, but the old school stuff that, that really we know works, we've got those charts out there uh, through GGS Pro and through companies like Marone who actually buy our equipment and do the testing. So again, you heard me say, keep the fans on if you can. And then this next one about where do I put my fogger when I fog? You know, that's a really good question that we always get. And we always say you want to aim for the dead space. You never want to get your plant material wet. If you do, you'll know it because you will have phytotoxicity because remember, it's very concentrated. So uh, uh, up and over the crop, in down an aisleway, as long as you're not fogging somewhere where you're going to create runoff, this will work. And alluding a little bit towards uh, Rick's choice in air-assisted fogging equipment, the particle size is really important. If, if someone has chosen a piece of equipment that has variability in their particle size as an ultra low volume fogger, you know it either because there's been a wet spot right in front of it or they had phytotoxicity over the bench that they tried to fog. Uh, you know, I will say the DRAM machines, yes, they are expensive as you heard Rick say, but they're very tight in their tolerances of particle size. So we're comfortable putting fog out over a crop without issues of phytotoxicity. Um, I will say, I, again, uh, as a kind of a tip, I've had, I had a grower who had a 300 foot long space and they thought it would be a really good idea to aim their fogger at their fan head. We would please say, don't do that because what happens is um, the fog head actually accumulates the active ingredient and creates particles that are big enough that, you know, it's like spitting on the plants with pure material. And this grower was basically getting phyto 20 feet in front of their fan. They thought they were doing a good thing. They were actually creating a little bit of harm. Uh, so don't shoot it at the fans, get it out there, let the currents of air do the work for you. And that will uh, now answer Saul's question about dead spots. Homogenation occurs through proper air movement, just not just the particle size. Uh, and, and, and Jared, then, Jared yeah. I want to I want to slow you down for just a second on this subject. Um, I've been in a bunch of the cannabis grows here in the east where they are filtering the air coming in to prevent um, insects and mites coming in. And they're also filtering the air going out to prevent that odor from permeating the countryside. What, what should they be doing with their um, air system? So that's a great question. I'll, I'll answer it now. I'm gonna allude to it a little later. And that's a really good comment because a lot of these indoor operations, even if they're not 
uh, doing an, uh, an air exchange with the outside environment. They're maybe they're recirculating because of their HVAC system because humidity is such a big conversation. Or maybe they have HEPA filters. Uh, so we, you know, the the HVAC system is maybe alarming because we are raising the humidity in that space and it's going. Oh my gosh, I got to get my humidity back to fifty percent. Get it all out of here. Exchange it. Get the dehues running. You're you're pulling your fog right out of the room. So if you're saying this stuff isn't working and you're not manipulating your control system and your HVAC, you're really just uh, pulling money right out of the air would be the best way to say it. So you gotta be able to work with your control system or manually override to allow for that humidity to increase for that time period that you are doing a fog cycle uh, because you're just pulling it out of the air. And the same with HEPA filters. If you're just recirculating the air and you've got a really fine filter and you come in the next day, it's all wet. You've, you've just pulled chemical right out of the air. So it's a great conversation with indoor growers that uh, maybe haven't uh, added a cycle within their control program to allow for a little bit of uh, leeway with humidity to allow that fog to get out there and, and move around. Does that answer that, Steve? Spot on, thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, so also worker entry, please take this into account. Your REI starts after the fog cycle is ended, not when you start. So, you know, Consideration on equipment might be, you know, if, if I've got, um, uh, you know, an auto fog and it takes three hours and it's a 12 hour REI, take that into consideration versus a pulse fog, which might take 15 minutes, depending on the size of it. So uh, REI and worker entry is a big conversation. And then uh, lastly, and I'm going to say this 50 times, the cleaner you keep these machines, the less issues you'll have, the less anger you'll have with yourself, with me, with Rick with anybody else because the you know big, big machines with big openings you can just throw in the corner even though I wouldn't recommend that but that's what that's just what happens the smaller the opening the more important it is to clean the machine and we have videos uh, out there on how to do this but please make it a routine every time you make an application with this kind of equipment if it's mine or somebody else's to clean up the tank to clean out the opening uh, and you'll be a much happier applicator from from day to day so um, a little bit of specifics about air-assisted uh, fogging apparatuses versus thermal foggers and biofoggers, uh, because right off the bat, autofog has no heat. So we don't have to worry about the heat conversation with autofog. It's air-assisted. There is no heat. And essentially, all we're doing is there's a, there's a compressor, oilless grade hospital compressor under that red cover. It's sending air through the clear hose on the side up to that nozzle. It's creating a venturi effect and it's pulling solution out of that tank right there down in the middle. And it all works depending on, it doesn't matter what size autofog you have, they all do the same thing. They all send air, create a venturi, pull the solution out, and that fogger head is machined to disperse those particles at a specific uh, rate. Uh, the, the mini autofog, if you got that, and our 110 volt SL is 45 milliliters or 45 cc's. The only thing that's bigger is our 220 volt machine, and that's 55 milliliters, 55 cc's. Um, so that's how they work. It's really simple, but again, you got to keep that stuff clean. You got to keep it soluble. So uh, again, uh, you've got a compressor, you've got the venturi going on. Uh, you do have tank agitation in these tanks, and I could talk a little bit. The mini autofog, if you do have one of those, it only has one timer, and the compressor comes on and the agitator comes on. Little tech tip, pull the plug for the agitator out of the mini auto fog and get it its own little $6 timer from Home, Do Home Depot and do some pre-agitation because it's just a kind of a price point. It doesn't fit on the machine to have two timers. The larger ones do have one for pre-agitation and pre-circulation, which is separate from the compressor, but the mini doesn't. So pull the plug, get another timer and create a little bit of pre-agitation because a lot of this product it's very important for it to be very soluble uh, to run through the small opening. Uh, secondarily is calibration with these machines. They, they run at a certain rate. And if you look at a manual, it says, if you have this much volume in the tank, it should take this long to disperse that. If your machine is not calibrated properly, uh, always when customers have product left in the tank the next day, it's either because it's not calibrated or it's not soluble enough or it's too thick and they've clogged it. That's usually, you know, the main reasons why or the head is just totally worn out and it can't pull that amount. So always check your calibration, make sure it's running at the rate, rate it should and make sure your product is dilute enough. And again, Rick's charts always help with that. Uh, but you can see 
our output can can go and, and look, remember this 40 to 120 minutes per 10,000 square feet, that's kind of fixed based on the output of the machine. When we get to the pulse fog, it's gonna be completely different. So that's how these machines work, really simple. If you keep them clean, you keep them calibrated, they're gonna have a lot of years of, of easy, good use with them. So, um, and just to show you what they look like, and before I get to this kind of video, you'll see in this picture, there is no compressor. Very large facilities, whether they're big vegetable ranges or if they have compressed air available, you can purchase just the head if you have the adequate volume of air. And it's a little over four CFM per head, but this grower has, I think, I don't know, 50 or 70 heads. It's a really big range and they run compressed air around and that way they don't need to buy compressors. So that is an option. I could keep going and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger but you can really see is all we're doing is air assisting to the nozzle it's pulling solution and it's 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 fogging and they're using the fans as the highway system to really move the product around and you'll see this sort of text sheet a lot of places are on our website and you see these square footage of with or without fans and they're pretty distinct you see how much more you get out of that but as again rick alluded to don't look at this number and think i'm covered i've got you know, I've got 60,000 square feet, I'm good to go. Rick right up, brought up a great point about dilution. And if some products require more water, that reduces the area that you can physically treat. So if a, if a machine that runs at two liters per 10,000 square feet on a 14 liter tank can do 70, if you need four liters to dilute that down, you've turned that big machine into a one acre, maybe a little more, depending on the, the thickness of the product. So. I always invite customers that want to buy anything from Dram to have a conversation so that you don't run into any surprises, but don't just go off of this because the product can be a, a reason to size up or size down or change the quantity that you might purchase. So really important point just beyond square footage. But you can see 110 volt, 110 volt. This is the 220 volt. This is really what you got to pick from with the air assisted machines. Um, so the next question is sizing, right? So area size, chemical use, HAF fans, power source, and we've covered a lot of this. You know, area size is one conversation to make a question. Can you draw plastic to create smaller spaces and just move the move the fogger around? Yeah, you know, just because someone has three acres, if they have the ability to split that in twos or two thirds or you know six spaces, you can maybe get a smaller machine if you don't have the power to run the 220 volt. So. There are ways around large area size if you have the ability to drop curtains or plastic. Um, again, fans, it's great for diffuse diffusion into canopy. It's also necessary for large spaces. Uh, and then chemical use, which Rick talked about, can be a really important, uh, you know, if you, need, if you need more tank size to get it dilute enough, that's really important. And of course, power, you know, if you only have 110 volt, you can't get 220, uh, you know, that's a, that's a conversation those fogger heads and compressors do separate. We give you long lengths of uh, air hose and electric so that if your power source is far away to get to 220, that's an option. But again, this grower on the right, he can't fog or she can't fog because you got open ends. This grower is really big. They have to, they don't have plastic. So they got to figure out their active and their, their fogger size just based on the square footage. So lots to consider when you're doing ultra low volume. And that conversation about fogging oxidizers uh, that Rick brought up. For those that have a auto fog for whatever size, you can see the difference right here between a brass head, which is standard on, on most auto fogs or all auto fogs, and the optional stainless steel unit that's necessary. Uh, you'll know it if you've run an oxidizer through a brass head because it just won't work that well anymore. So you can get the stainless steel version afterwards. It is more expensive than buying it new. Uh, so it's a smaller bullet to bite when you get an SS machine with an SS nozzle early than paying an extra 700 bucks more because we can use the lower portion. So if you've got a machine and you're wondering, unscrew the cap, take a look, and then screw the cap on and, and make sure it's calibrated when you put that cap back on. Um, it's good good trials. Again, essentials for auto fogging, you heard me say it, keep it clean, keep it diluted, keep it calibrated. Those are the three. 
And then if you have an auto fog, you should be getting a $30 maintenance kit for these expensive machines. And we got a video on how to change out some of the O-rings and the filters. But this is really it. If you do this, you know, and you know your rates, you're going to be good to go with auto fogging. So everyone says, I just want an auto fog. And you heard, you heard Rick say, man, auto fog is, it's the way to go. Well, not in this situation, because if you count these up, there's what, 13, 14, 15 individual spaces. And if it's an hour a night to get to each one of these done, you just can't do it unless you got a bunch of auto fogs. And I will say, we have growers, there's a great big grower down on the East Coast, and he must have 30 auto fogs because he doesn't want anybody in there. He doesn't want to waste labor. But if you've got a, a space like this with a bunch of individual spaces, this is not the place to be running auto fog unless you know your pest and your disease and your life cycle, or you have a couple of them. We would call this pulse fog heaven for us because man, you could get to each one of these 30 by 150s and you'd be done in, I don't know, three to five minutes, depending on the machine you have. And you could, you could get all these done in a night if you wanted to. So there are definite reasons why auto fog doesn't work. And the number of spaces is definitely a consideration. And you can see it right here, nine greenhouses in 20 minutes. You, you couldn't do nine greenhouses. You could, you'd could. you have nine greenhouses, you'd have nine days is what you'd have. So speed portability is what we're getting with pulse fog, even though there's a little bit of labor to it. And it's a little bit, you know, a little rougher. It sounds, it's loud. And you know, let's get into that a little bit, right? So these are gas powered machines. Basically all we're doing is starting this sucker up uh there's a solution tank here and it's pressurizing the tank and there's a valve that you can kind of see but you open up that valve and it's pushing the solution through in this barrel we're basically making a bunch of explosions about 80 90 per second and we're creating heat but we're also creating energy and we're injecting our solution into the barrel and it's essentially shattering the particle uh, we're not using that finely machine nozzle we're shattering with brute force to create a vapor to shoot out of that. And Rick alluded to it, you do need a carrier with this. Again, it's a little rougher, it's a little sloppier than the really nice auto fog, but we're using that Nutrifog, that adjuvant to help break those particles apart and also help keep them separated when they're floating around the space because we have a little bit more variability in particle size. So we're shattering those particles. And of course you have an operator present. It's going really quickly, but you still do need to have someone. Everybody asks, can I, if I've got six acres and I've got a K50 here, which is our monster, you know, can I leave that go? No, this is a gas machine. There's fire. You never want to leave it alone, even though you're not there for very long. So um, just to give you an idea and turn your volume down, because you're going to know one thing with pulse fog, it's really loud. It's like a Harley without an exhaust pipe. So I'm going to crank on the sound here, but turn it down if you need to. going to skip ahead so you can see what the fog looks like as you can see there's nothing there's nowhere for anywhere any any flying insects or disease to go in a space like this so that was a carrier it wasn't any chemical which is why you saw louie without any gloves we would always recommend the proper ppe and just to just to actually a tech tip on ppe if you are fogging you want to make sure that your uh, masks are rated for dust and smoke. So it's a smaller particle. You want to make sure you've got the right kind of ventilation or a casco helmet, a positive pressure helmet. So uh, a little side tip there. Uh, again, just like the auto fog, these machines are sized based on how much you want to do, how fast you want to do it in. These three sizes are all the same tank size, 10 liters. There's about an acre's worth in here. This one throws about 50 feet, 60 feet, 65. This is 120. This is 175. So Again, we're going to get into why, but you can see, uh, you know, and then there are bio options for these as well. A couple of these machines, we're going to get into bios. There's only two or three options. So you want to make sure you understand why. And if you're using bios, uh, you know, you want to get the right kind of machine. Just so you know, you cannot take a standard pulse log and make it a bio. You got to get the one with the bio. So, um, uh, you know, again, pulse fog sizing, similar questions, maybe a couple of others. Uh, so area size, how much am I doing? Chemical use, just like I talked about. 
But a little bit of differences is if I've got a bunch of houses that are 150 feet long, you know, unless I want to go in it with a smaller machine and work my way out, I may want to size a machine based on the length of that house. Same with the area. If I've got six acres to do, I don't want to do a machine and have to fill it up four times. I want to size that machine to get it all done in 50 minutes and just go home and be done. And then the bio conversation, because we got a lot of heat with a standard pulse fog, but you can get bio pulse fogs that are out there. You saw the injection point right here. When you're running heat sensitive products, you know, you can't do it through a standard machine because it's just too darn hot. So we have equipment out there for thermal fogging. You can see we have two different tanks here. And this is a K22 bio. We make a K3020 bio and then our K40, K50, those are all bio ready. But what we do is your front tank, which is your water, your chemical or active ingredient, your bio, and your adjuvant, your Nutrifog, is injected right here. But behind that, we have a tank of just water, which is essentially making it a little bit easier, reducing the energy and the heat in that barrel so we don't toast all of our friendlies that we're trying to get out there to do what they do. So uh, note that when you do that, everything goes in the front tank and only water goes in the back when you're making uh, up your bio or heat sensitive product. And of course, dilution, just like Rick talked about uh, with your, I'm going to go back actually, just like Rick talked about with auto fogs and tank sizing, you know, this K22 bio is a 25, 30,000 square foot machine. But if I need double the water, I've taken my area almost in half sometimes, depending on dilution, because it's got to be thin enough to go through. So consider tank sizing, how often you're going to fill it up and, and, and have a conversation with DRAM. That's what we're here for. Uh, Pulse fog essentials, just like the auto fog, keep it clean. It's a small opening. You know, use new gas. Gas doesn't last as long as it used to. We want to use 92, 93 octane. Uh, we don't need turbo blue, but we don't want to use 87. Uh, but there are parts on this piece of equipment that are under a lot of stress. The diaphragms in the carburetor, uh, the tubing that can dry over a period of years. We've got every piece of uh, part, every part that this thing has. We've been selling these things for 40, 50 years. Uh, you can do it yourself. You can send it in, but we've got parts. Have them on hand. Uh, batteries to start it. You know, I, I can walk you through all the all the things you need to know if you buy a pulse fog on on running it. And for growers that do have pulse fogs in their barn that they just they put away for many years, usually it was someone's uh, elder that did the fogging and they had an issue with a uh, phyto or the machine never worked right. It kept clogging. Just like Rick talked about. You know, these machines haven't changed. Everything around it has. We used to run VK1, VK2 as an old school carrier combination for uh, standard products and ECs. We don't even really sell that stuff anymore. So, uh, you know, if you had issues with Fido due to your carrier, don't worry about it anymore. Bring that pulse, bring that fogger out. Um, and the same with chemistries. The old school chemistries were 30 ounces, 50 ounces, they were powders. All the new stuff is very low rate. So get that fogger out of the barn, get it cleaned up, send it in. We'll get it going again and, and you know, save yourself some time. So uh, now onto the decision part. You've heard all the conversation between Rick and I, and it's like, what do I do? And that's probably another hour long conversation. That's where talking to uh, Rick and GGS Pro and, and Colin Dram to say, hey, here's my situation at my greenhouse and my at my indoor space. What's best for me? That's really what we want. We want you to pick the right tool for your toolbox. Uh, so, you know, great. The auto fog's you know, very low labor. The pulse fog's very fast. This is electric. This is gas. This is bios all day. This is bios maybe. It's a great long conversation. And that's why, uh, you know, you have this team here, which is one of me ending with, uh, depending on where you're at, you can get a hold of us. And if one of us isn't around, somebody else will be able to help you. Uh, but we're here to answer all those questions before you make a, a purchase. Like you heard Rick say, this stuff isn't cheap, but it does work well. So I'll end with that. I appreciate uh, me trying to cram all that in in a half hour. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Jared. Really, really informational. And I, I can tell from the questions that um, you've sparked a lot of interest. <laughs> yes. Okay, yep. so we are getting, um, so 
So uh, I just want to make sure I was trying to keep up and pay attention to which ones you were kind of answering through. I just want to double check. Do you recommend using HAF fans in a greenhouse to mix fog evenly in a greenhouse? And you said absolutely not. That can actually cause more problems, correct? Wait, I'm sorry. I missed the question. Do you recommend using HAF fans in a greenhouse to mix the fog evenly in a greenhouse? I do. I do recommend that. Oh, yeah. okay. All yes. right. Yes. Yeah, you definitely... Uh, and, and depending on the space, you you almost need it sometimes. So uh, yeah, I always recommend if you have fans, use them. Okay, what is the effect of small droplet size, five to 20 microns at the applicator respiration when using chemicals? Again, I think I, think I alluded to that with the proper PPE. You yeah. wanna make sure that the equipment that you're using, you wanna cover all your holes, cover your body with your Tyvek suit, but you want to make sure that any uh, filters that you have in your equipment, and I'll let Rick also speak on this, uh, are, are, are within the specs of the particles that you're working with. Again, dust and smokes are what I recommended for choosing filtration. Yep. Thank you for that reminder. Okay. Can you discuss the REI rules with fogging and ventilation? Uh, when does REI start versus when the fogging ends and yep. when ventilation starts to end? to the end of that REI. Yeah, I'm going to start and I'm going to set Rick up real quick, but actually <laughs> I know you know this, so I'm going to let you tackle it. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise, the, the CDC actually has weighed in on this issue and it might be easier to offer to, to send the whole bulletin to anybody that's inter interested in it, but there is um, an inhalation uh, requirement that runs concurrently with the REI. So they give you a bunch of options how you can satisfy the ventilation requirement. It can be 10 air exchanges. It can be, I mean, they give you all kinds of options. Four hours of ventilation with vents uh, followed by one hour of mechanical ventilation or 24 hours of no ventilation. Both of them have to be fulfilled, the REI and the ventilation requirement, but they can run, they run concurrently. So with a 12 hour REI, if it takes you 12 hours to meet the ventilation requirement, you're set. Okay, so I'm going to just add then if Rick or Jared, you have specific bulletins or white papers that you referenced in your presentation mm -hmm. or you know would help better answer these questions um, in a visual way, please send them to me and I will make sure to include them in the follow up email so that everybody okay. that registered for this webinar has that information. Because that's the focus here is just to share knowledge, right? Okay. Yes, Rick, I'm going to handle that one. I know you got all that. Uh, that I, yeah. I've got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next question uh, from Nabil. Uh, will using fans spread the spray chemicals outside into the atmosphere? No, they should not because this is a bubble. So nothing should be exiting. When you do fog, you need to remember first and foremost, you need a bubble. It, everything should be contained. Nothing should leave. And everything should fall out. Now, the reason we moved to that conversation about ventilation is because some particles just may never fall out, which is why we're following those rules for a certain number of turns of air of that space. But if you got that place buttoned up, nothing should leave. All right, I'm going to try to get through a few more questions. If I don't get through them now, you guys, we're going to go through them at the end of the presentation because we have our colleague Steve still has to give his his portion. And I know we're we're creeping up on the 90 minutes. Um, Saul, is an electric pulse fog on the horizon? So, no, there is no electric pulse fog. However, there is a hybrid unit out there uh, called a turbo and um, turbo UOV, which is which is a 110 volt powered unit that can act as both a uh, ultra low volume fogger or a uh, low volume kind of cold fogger. Um, and I think there's a picture of it right there. Uh, so it's not as fast as a pulse fog. It's not as big in terms of, you know, moving, uh, moving from space to space and storage as a cold fogger. But depending on the, you see that nozzle, you see that blue nut with that gold nozzle that that solution nozzle dictates the flow rate which dictates the particle size coming out of this so this is kind of a hybrid unit it, it, it's not doing 50,000 square feet at a time it, you know it's it's for t spot misting or you know someone's got a couple of houses but that can do uh some uh ultra low volume floating fog but also act as a cold fogger all right but that's, that's about it for uh electric uh thermal fogging 
Yes. Okay. All right. We're going to grab the rest of the questions and um, at the end. So if for some reason I miss a question that you posted, just post it again when we finish the presentation. Okay. So it doesn't get messed up because we're going to just bombard the chat right now with another. Uh, well, actually, no, we're not because some people cannot access the chat for whatever reason. And I apologize for that. We are working very hard to figure out why some people can access the chat. If you can't, you can email myself or Brenda or Lindsay. Um, you should have all of our emails at this point. Uh, you can just email me the question. Ideally me, um, I'm checking the emails. I've already got a couple questions in the lineup. So send the questions to me. Because we have some people that can't access the chat, they can't win a prize. So we're gonna do something different. Jared, pick a number one through uh, 141. 26. 26, all right, cool. Um, so I'm gonna find participant number 26 and you are going to get to pick a prize. How, how's that? <laughs> All right, we make it work. We're gonna quickly transition over to my colleague, Steve, um, who's gonna talk a little bit more about how you can use biologicals in fogging applicators. Steve. Thanks, Angela. So this year we, um, and we, this is clients driving us at this point. We started hearing about a lot of applications of our products um, through foggers. And so we started looking into seeing how well they would work. We purchased one of the mini foggers. It's out at our lab in Davis. Um, and so um, the lab techs did a bunch of work. And so we developed this technical bulletin. I saw in the registration materials that you could access it there. At the very end, you'll have my email as well, or you can contact Angela to get a copy of this technical bulletin. Next slide, please. I'm going to go quick to try and get us back on schedule. So Regalia, um, this is what uh, Marone was built on. Regalia is giant knotweed extract. It, it's an extract of Renaltria sacclinensis. Um, you can see the rate there, and on that same fogging bulletin, um, these rates are right there. Uh, the rate is uh, if you're going to spray, it's one ounce per gallon in a hydraulic or backpack sprayer, uh, but it's 10 ounces per 3,000 square foot or 29.4 ounces in 10,000 square foot. Um, Regalia's mode of action is 100% preventative. It turns on the SAR, ISR uh, pathways, biochemical pathways inside a plant. And so um, you got to make sure that you are using this ahead of a disease, especially powerful for powdery mildew, but it's a nice boost for a lot of other materials. It's incredibly tank mix friendly. Um, you can apply it in an awful lot of other ways. The label's got a lot of information on it. Next slide, please. Um, this is, it's really powerful for powdery mildew. Next slide, please. I'm going to work to get us back on schedule. So these are the modes of action of regalia. Um, through this SAR, ISR pathways, and these are two distinct but overlapping uh, biochemical pathways inside the plant. Um, it turns on the plant's own natural defense system, but it turns them onto a really high level. And there's a lot of compounds that the plants make, phytoalexins, phenolics, uh, uh, pathogenesis, resistance proteins. It turns them all on. It does a great job of preventing diseases. Uh, powdery mildew is one of our real strong points. Um, it also will strengthen cell walls. So it causes the cell walls to accumulate lignin, which are really tough materials. That helps to prevent the penetration peg of quite a number of diseases. Um, and uh, regalia also acts as a biostimulant. We'll often see yield increases in tomatoes, peppers, and cannabis crops. Um, you'll often can also see them greening up more than they were. This is because regalia will increase chlorophyll production in the plant. It's not unusual to see plants um, that have had regalia applied to it. Just simply look healthier. Next slide, please. This is Stargus. Stargus is our newest biofungicide. Um, it's a bacillus material, really powerful for downy mildew, botrytis, white mold, a number of leaf spots um, uh, like Cercospora. Next slide, please. And so this is a liquid biofungicide. So it, it, it goes in, it fogs very well. Um, quite a number of foliar and soil borne diseases. Obviously, we're talking fogging here today. Um, if you're using it for soil borne diseases like Fusarium, which is one of its real strong points, also Phytophthora and Rhizoctonia, you would be applying those as a, as a drench. Whole other part of, of uh, application equipment, but they, those are all to be applied as drenches. 
Uh, this, although you are applying a live bacteria, a live bacteria um, in fermentation, it produces these peptides, and the peptides are what do all the heavy lifting in disease control. It's got quite a number of um, multiple and novel modes of action. Also, because it's a bacillus, it helps turn on some of the SAR parts of the plant. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the modes of action, and I've gone over all of these. And again, we're running out of time, so we're going to go to the next slide. I want to get a couple of other products in. Here are the rates; they are all on this, all on this bullet. And we've we've looked into this. We've got we're pretty firm on these rates at this point. Next slide, please. Uh, Venerate XC and CG. Um, XC is our older label. It's out. It's our outdoor and general hort label. CG is our indoor and cannabis label. Um, this is a heat killed Burke Holderi bacteria. So there's no live bacteria in there. Um, again, it produces the the uh, bacteria has produced a number of compounds that are doing all the heavy work. Really powerful for sucking, chewing insects and mites. You can see the rates there again. Uh, the two ounce is for a backpack or hydraulic sprayer, sprayer application and there's the 3,000 square foot and 10,000 foot um, 10,000 square foot fogging rates all on there um, reapply every seven to ten days really powerful material next slide please um, wide range of crops next slide please um, it's an IGR type thing. Um, so venerate works through ingestion. That's its mode of entry, not its not its uh, mode of action. And so one of the neat things about this material is because it works primarily by ingestion, it's really safe for a number of uh, biological organisms. Next slide, please. Oh, we're still loading this one. Let's skip to let's just skip to the next slide again. We're 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 running out of time, and so um, we have trialed it on uh, sweet potato destroyer, mealybug destroyer, predatory nights. I know a lot of folks use uh, Amblesius californicus. Um, it's safe for bumblebees. Those of you who are growing tomatoes and using them for pollination, it's safe for bumblebees, parasitic wash, predatory midges, road beetle, also aureus. Um, really important in pepper operations. Um, at the worst, you may see a little loss of fecundity, um, the production of, uh, of of more of these. But if you're doing regular releases, you're going to find Venerate to be completely compatible um, with, with uh, releasing your uh, biocontrol organisms. Next slide, please. We also offer our own peroxyacetic acid materials, jet ag and jet oxide, um, really powerful for helping to sanitize surfaces. Um, it'll do a nice job of preventing disease. Again, the rates are on there. Next slide, please. Um, so the jet ag, which is the more commonly used one for fogging, it's a five, it's a 4.9% solution of peroxyacetic acid plus hydrogen peroxide. It's really stable. Um, you'll see there's a, on our label, it's a very wide rate range. Um, this is a conversation that Rick and I had when we sent this bulletin out and um, we are, the lower rate rates are the ones that are most commonly used and we'll probably be doing some editing to our guide. Um, it's going to be really hard hard to put 60 ounces into 3,000 square foot, but between 10 and 20 ounces, you'll be doing just fine. Next slide, please. Um, here's how you get hold of us. Um, and so you'll see my email is on the far right. I cover the 13 nor Northeast states, sbogash at maroonbio.com. For those of you in other areas, you can do a quick hunt around. Uh, but again, you can always contact me or Angela or Brenda, and we'll help you find the rep in your particular area. Next slide, please. Um, this is the technical support team. You'll see I'm listed here as well. I'm the last one in the company that wears two hats. I provide product development and technical support along with sales in the Northeast. Um, and you, you can see your tech reps for, for the rest of the country. And Angela, I think this is the end of my slide, so I'm going to turn this back over to you. Awesome. OK, so we're going to do one more uh, prize just because I feel awful for the people that couldn't access the chat for the first question. So, Steve, go ahead and pick a number one through 141. 73. I was I was okay. muted. Awesome. Awesome. And I apologize if I cough. I've got a terrible. I 
the coffee went down the wrong tube this morning and it happened. To be uh, that's, that's tough. So <laughs> anyway. before, before we end this though, cause I see yeah. we're, I mean, we are out sure. of time. I have two questions for Rick and Jared that I think are really important. Um, actually three. So one of them, how uh, relative humidity, does it matter at all? Or are we adjusting the relative hu humidity enough with fogging that that is not an issue? I'd say it's really not important, Steve. If the relative humidity is low, you might raise it a little bit. Um, I, I say if it's really low, if you're in Arizona in the summertime, the relative humidity might be so low that your particles are evaporating before they hit the surface, uh, leaf surfaces. But I think it's minor. I, I don't think it's an issue. So that All gets right. us to water quality and pH of the water. Should um, Is it worthwhile to use distilled water? I saw there was an RO question that came across. Does it matter? Um, what if you're here in the Northeast where we've got karst-based water with a um, <laughs> 400 parts per million of alkalinity and a pH of 8.2? What do we do I've, with that? I've seen it. Um, you would use the same procedure uh, that you would if you were hydraulically spraying. So uh, Griffin produces a bulletin, that all the pesticides that we sell um, with the optimum spray water pH is from the manufacturer. So there's a product called Indicate 5, which uses a color change to optimize the pH of the solution. If you've got water like you just described, you'd want to use that product for fogging just like you would for hydraulic spraying. Just have a whole lot less water you have to modify. Sure. And and so, Jared, sure. goes back to your maintenance thing. Um, these high limestone waters, are they going to plug up your air sprayer if they don't do if they don't follow that instruction? I don't believe they will. If you've got bad water quality issues, you probably see them all everywhere else in the greenhouse more than, you know, more than just at your sprayer. You're probably clogging drippers more than anything or, you know, getting some biofilm. So um, if you've got other water, water quality issues, you you probably want to call Dran to talk about your water, not uh, your water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, and my and my last one, and wait, Angela may the, Angela wait. may try and squeeze a few more in. But do you leave if you're in an indoor grow where you are relying on lights? Do you leave the lights on while you fog or shut them off? Typically, it's done when lights are off. Um, so uh, Rick may have a another point to add to that because we do fog when lights are on when it's cloudy uh so yeah no i, th I think you you, you want to do when the lights are off typically it's being done at night when your help's not there and the lights are off sure. at that point anyway so yeah okay and back to you angela steve i want to go back to one one more oh, point sure. on water quality for our indoor growers because some of them are utilizing extreme forms of water treatment like reverse osmosis so you want to make sure that if you are using our only water, if you look at any of our, our equipment, uh, we don't want straight RO water going through the equipment. It's hungry, it's stealing metals, and it's leaching out and ending up in the plants. However, Rick and their team came up with a great solution, and that's, I think the rate is 19 grams per hundred of uh, bicarb. Uh, Potassium bicarbonate, it's yeah. Bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that adds a little bit of alkalinity to your water. So please don't use straight RO. Add a little bit, a bit of passing by carbonate, build a little alkalinity, shouldn't hurt anything, and definitely will save the life of your equipment. Yeah. Some facilities, they can just grab the water before their RO treatment to use that for their fogging. Yep, you can do that too. So go ahead. I'm, I'm done. Yep. And I'm done. Okay. All right. <laughs> Pull the uh, curtain. Really, <laughs> really quickly, do you have an, uh, I'm getting questions through my email from a couple of people. Do you have an electro, electrostatic fogger? Uh, no, we, we don't, but that's you may have seen something online. We just dropped. Uh, we are introducing a brand new Lance that is combining the uh, benefits of electrostatic, which is essentially taking a charge and the, the, basically the particles are repelling when they come out and they want to find something that's grounded, which allows for improved contact in these very dense canopies. We talked about hydraulic spraying and being the you can't get great contact and get around stuff. And the problem with electrostatic is that it's very slow and doesn't go very far. So we got this new Lance that we're gonna be showcasing in a couple of weeks event at MJ BizCon, if you'll be out there, that is basically combining the electrostatic nature with a battery powered Lance with the high volume application of hydraulic. We're really excited about it. Um, it's only being announced and shown there. It won't be for sale. We're still fine tuning it, but we're, we're definitely going to have it out there for, for, for everyone. So, but yeah, that's what, that's the closest we got for electrostatic.
and and Jared, you had mentioned that you are you are shifting your focus. Um, I'm going to do a quick plug because you guys are hiring your you're hiring your own replacement right now. So um, <laughs> anybody on this call that's that that wants to go to work for Dram, just contact you or what should they do? Uh, they can probably they probably saw it on LinkedIn, but you can get a hold of Kurt Becker. Yeah, if you live in the Northeast and you like water and you like uh, helping growers out and being an educator instead of a salesperson. That DRAM is all about sales through education more than anything. So uh, we're happy to have anybody send send in your uh, your resume or, or email Kurt Becker. And you're Solid. welcome. And you're very welcome for that plug. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, please hurry. Yes. <laughs> all right. So really quickly, thanks to those who are still hanging on. We're going to wrap it up. Peter, that uh, Peter, you emailed me a question, and I actually forward it to our speakers and I will make sure somebody replies to you directly because it's really a math equation that you're looking for. Um, so I think that's going to be best answered via email versus over the webinar. If anybody else um, has a question that they desperately need answered now, post it in the chat so we can we can address it very quickly. I think we answered most of them. Um, I will be sharing, if, if the speakers allow, I'll be sharing contact information in the follow-up email. So you can just click a link and email the speakers directly with any additional questions that may arise. I just wanna again remind you, if you're on for CEUs, we're wrapping it up now so you can sign off. If you wanna take the quiz right away, you need to take the quiz in order to get your credits, okay? That's how we issue the certificate of attendance. All you have to do is open up your camera app and hover it over the QR code. That'll probably produce a pop-up or a drop-down menu on your phone. You're going to click it and that'll take you into the quiz. All right. I'll also have a link to the quiz and the follow-up email, but you need to take that quiz if you want credit. Um, for California, or excuse me, certified crop advisors, you're going to have to self-report your attendance. Uh, Arizona course ID was located. It's right there. So if you just take a screenshot of this or a photo of this, it's always good to keep on your file. Washington and Oregon participants, just a reminder, you needed to participate with those questions throughout the webinar. If for some reason you couldn't access the chat, just message me. I will make it work. We'll, we'll make it happen however we need to. Um, we didn't anticipate this technical problem again, and we will submit your names to those states. If if there are any other questions, I'm going to close out my screen so I can just check the chat one last time. I have to say thank you so much to Jared and Rick for all the time that you gave us today and most importantly, the information. Um, just really impressive on the, the educational quality of these presentations. And of course, Steve, for spearheading this idea um, and helping organize the speakers, really appreciate that. With that, I'm just checking the chat one more time, you guys. Well, and, I and, while you, and while you do that, for those who are still on, if you have ideas for other webinars, you want to dig deeper on any of this, please let us know. Yeah, and I saw two quick ones come in. One was, uh, do I need to carry for my autofog? Uh, no, you don't, except I think Rick mentioned a little bit of capsule if it's a really thick old school product. And the other one was, I got a long, narrow corridor. Do I, do I you know, will the autofogger work? Uh, it will. However, you do need some help getting that fog down the long bay. If you got a 200 foot tunnel, it's not going to make it all the way down there on its on its own with a mini auto fog. So you do need a little bit of air movement to help push it down. All right. Oh, and I, I can't access the chat myself. I'm one of the dysfunctional attendees. <laughs> so I was trying to post the URL for the, the quiz in the chat, and I apologize, I can't. An email will be going out later today, you guys. Um, if for some reason you need it pronto, you know how to, you know how to um, get a hold of me, okay? With that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for all of your interest in this topic. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. We hope to see you on a future webinar. And thank you, Brenda. There she goes. So Brenda can access the chat. There's the survey monkey link. Um, like Steve said, if you have any feedback or suggestions for future webinar topics, please let us know. Our mission at Marone Bio is really just to educate. And then hopefully through that effort, um, we will be able to advance the adoption of biologicals and growing healthier uh, plants around the world. So that's really why we're, we're doing these webinars. So thanks again for attending. Thank you, speakers. Everyone have a wonderful day. Stay safe and hopefully we'll see you out in the field or in a greenhouse or at a trade show soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks, Steve. Yep.